everyone, welcome. We are at Health Impact. It's Megan Antonelli. I'm here with Janae Sharp, and we are excited to be meeting with and interviewing Ligia Ricciardi today, the CEO and founder of Ada Rose. I've known Ligia for a long time. I think, you know, not she doesn't need much of an introduction. Everyone knows her uh, in the digital health space. Um, uh, welcome, Ligia. Thank you so much, Megan and Janae. I am so excited to be speaking with you today. Yeah, it's great. I was so glad we got to connect and I got to learn about Ada Rose last year. And we had, um, you know, the great idea to share it with some of our uh, health impact VIP speakers and and contacts this summer, this over the holiday. And um, people loved it. So tell us about how you came to uh, find, found um, Ada Rose and, and sort of the experience there. Yeah, absolutely. Um... So first of all, thank you so much for supporting Ada Rose and me. We really appreciate it and introducing what we do to a broader audience. Um, sort of based on what you said, I think a lot of folks know I've had a career in digital health with a particular emphasis, mostly on healthcare, but really what got me into this space was about how technology could give people, regular people, AKA patients, caregivers, that sort of thing, more agency with regard to their health care. And that's through a lot of things. It's access to information. It's access to peers. It's also being able to um, record your own data and share it in ways that we never could. And I, you know, over the course of my own life and career, certainly have used that in a number of instances, um, probably most dramatically when I helped my youngest daughter avoid an unnecessary open heart surgery through kind of research and data collection. So that was huge. But really I learned that from patients and other folks out there who've been doing this live. And increasingly I've been thinking about, well, how do we apply this not just to healthcare, but to well-being and health? Because more and more I think we need to emphasize more on like prevention, holistic well-being. And the truth is the impact that the individual can have in that space is even greater in day-to-day -day wellness than it is in healthcare. So fast forward a bit, particularly during the pandemic, like you guys and a lot of other Americans, and I would say people worldwide, I was under a huge amount of stress. I was, uh, you know, I mean, it was a pandemic. It was terrifying. We were in quarantine, of course. This was me and two kids, a family, two cats. Um, in the middle of Washington, D.C., which I am, there was a heck of a lot going on politically, socially. There were marches every time. Like the tension was unbelievable. So I was thinking, what can I do to help people like me, very much me included, like manage this stress, manage this sense of feeling in, in a weird way overconnected to some people, but disconnected from the outside world. So I wanted to take what I've learned from um, startups, in particular, Carium, where I was working most recently before that, and say, like, how do I build like a well-being solution? And I wasn't initially sure exactly what that would look like. So I started off interviewing tons and tons of people and saying, like, what does wellness or self-care look like to you? Um, I found a partner who's another woman who was kind of stressed out during the pandemic. And we started developing, developing physical boxes of things that we could send to people, always with this idea of blending the physical and the digital, because that's more compelling, at least to me, but I think to most humans, than digital alone. So I'm a strong believer in the digital component of things. And I think it can sort of marry well with physical and other types of interactions for like the ultimate kind of support. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, definitely the pandemic and the intensity of stress there came together with like my own background of let's empower people to do stuff with technology to live their best lives. And that's kind of how Ada Rose was born. By the way, the name comes from um, the daughter. So the one with the open heart surgery that we uh, avoided. Um, her first name is Ada. Her middle name is Rose. So that's an oh, example that. again from our lives of like, you know, what this looks like. Like it's right. part of you. I also, um, I was part of that. I remember you interviewed me during that period. It was fun. You were an awesome interviewee and particularly as a, a parent and professional whom I know and somebody who pushes the boundaries of what other people have done in that sphere, you were an awesome participant in that, Janae. Oh, thanks. Yeah, we got to talk about well-being and 
And I like your approach too. Like we have this increasingly digital world and you have this impressive background in digital health. Not, I don't know if everybody knows that, but I'll let you talk about that. I also want to know more about like Ada Rose has this holistic view, right? Including digital. Um, how does that translate into like your, how did that translate into products for you? Yeah. So um, background in a nutshell, I've been in digital health and what used to be called health IT and sometimes still is for about 20 years in a variety of different places from the Markle Foundation to the federal government where I uh, ran consumer engagement for ONC. Um, I've had a strong consumer focus throughout the whole time. Also worked at Carium and another startup earlier in my life. Um, so that's the digital health background. And you were kind of asking, Janae, what were you asking about the um, the combination of digital and and digital other and holistic things? health? Like, yeah. what does that? So, okay, so what does that mean? You know what I mean? Like, is yeah. this just like <laughs> fab fit fun? You know. <laughs> so I want to talk about sort of what is holistic health first, because there's yeah. a lot of different pieces there. So to me, again, sitting in my and I am actually right now even in my basement. Uh, although I tried to make it look a little less basementy, um, but there's like a water heater behind there. But anyway, feeling super stressed during pandemic quarantine, holistic health, of course, is taking care of your body, your mind. Those are the two big sort of chunks, um, but also other things like your social life and so on. So that's like a sense of holistic well-being. Of course, it includes things like nutrition and sleep and financial well-being and all these things, but you've got to narrow it down a little bit. Um, how I think about that with regard to digital and physical and why the physical part mattered to me, I feel like I have over the years um, used and come into contact with a whole lot of tools and approaches that use digital technologies in super impressive ways, a whole variety of them. From again, sharing information to engaging people. There's a lot of behavior change science uh, work and research done by BJ Fogg, among other people, about how you change people's behaviors um, through, you know, habit formation and things like that. And a lot of that is applied to the digital space. But I feel like in our push forward toward more digital, it's also really important not to forget the impact of your physical space, which literally, it, again, if you think about a behavior change model more broadly, you have to take into account not just what's going on on your screens, but like the actual physical space that you're in. So yeah, I mean, we started experimenting, Janae, after speaking with you and numerous other folks, with putting in a box, like the first thing we started doing was developing physical boxes that we could send to people so that they could have the props around them that would help them then use digital tools. So. To be super concrete, this is a spa in a box. This was the first thing we developed, though it's been through a few iterations. But it's got all this stuff because a lot of people equated spa with relaxation. And um, anyhow, not everybody did, but this was a way to kind of mix the physical and the mental well being in that you have in here stuff you need to do like an at home spa. This is a hairband. This is a cleanser, a mask, some facial moisturizer, hand moisturizer, an aromatherapy candle. These are physical things. But if you just got this, you'd be like, oh yeah, great. I never really have time to do that, whatever. So we put a digital, like a QR code on the top. And if somebody gets this as a standalone gift, which is an option, they can scan it with their phone and they can choose a length of program where you have experts, in this case, a mindfulness expert and an esthetician who talk you through stuff using the things. So like you light the candle and you do particular stretches and you learn these repeatable things that you can do. But because you're following along with like a human, um, you're more likely to actually do it and to learn these specific skills. We soon realized that this was particularly effective when you actually do it in a live event where you have numerous peers coming together, um, whether it's through the, it's usually through a corporation, but we've also done it with some other groups like Hit Like a Girl, which isn't strictly a corporation, um, but uh, well, it is a company, but the point is the participants were not all employees together. 
they were members of a group um, who participated in this event. And so this is an example of how you're taking the physical and the digital together and motivating change. So that was like product one. And then we really built on it, again, based on more interviews with more people, including, I will say, a higher proportion of men. I had initially started off interviewing women, particularly, in part because as a working mother, the stress that I was experiencing during COVID quarantine, some of it had to do with the parenting thing. Not that men don't experience that stress too, but as the mother of two teen and at the time tween girls, there was a lot of, um, you know, challenges with overuse of social media, uh, anxiety, depression, you name it. I saw this in my own kids as well as in kids of friends. And this made my mothering all the more intense and stressful in addition to my work as a professional. So anyway, box two, which in included more uh, input from men as well as women, is a work break in a box which has things, again, that include the physical and the mental well-being. On the physical side, it's things like a resistance band that you can use either to just stretch or to really strengthen various parts of the body. There's a massage, a pressure point massage ball that you use to kind of like roll like your shoulder up against a wall or your foot against the floor. And then on the kind of mental well-being side, there is an aromatherapy roll-on that people can use to kind of, I mean, just opening it, it smells really good and kind of relaxing. It's got like fir tree and lavender and things like that. But you can also use it through exercises to focus on your senses and feel more present. Um, and then finally, there's a desk board that you can use to write things, essentially to journal or put reminders that stays on your desk. Here too, yeah, exactly. Um, we had experts who helped, like, we didn't just pull these things out of nowhere. Like we talked to a physical therapist and a corporate mindfulness coach and decided like, what can we put in a box that we can send to people that you can help develop little micro exercises with. So back to the digital piece too. Now what we do mostly is work with corporations to send them boxes, send their employees boxes, have them call into an event learn all these skills that they can do with these components. And then we send them digital nudges and things that help them repeat them and internalize them. So yeah, I mean, part of it too, we've learned things along the way from interviewing people. Like if you have something on your desk that you can see and it's like within arm's reach, it's really not that big a deal to like pick it up and deal with it. But if it's like across the room, locked in a, I don't know, box somewhere, it's harder to get to. So part of this is about setting up your physical space around your maybe remote desktop or wherever you are. It could be your, your office if you're in a regular office. But we're particularly thinking about remote and hybrid workforces in which at least some of the people are at a distance. And we want to make sure that they all have access to kind of physical tools that make wellness and engagement easier. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. I mean, just the difference. I love all of that. And, and I, I love having it on my desk and I, I do love using the band. Um, and I think, you know, and I would use it if I was in an office, it's not, um, but when we, we, we went with the work box to, to share with people, um, the work break box, um, and I think that that, you know, it is a good tool to use um, both at the office and remote, but with how things have changed, right. Where you have almost, very, you know, so many people have so such little separation between their workspace and home now from, you know, coming out of the pandemic that it is, you know, it, it's that much more important. And then, I, I mean, what I also love about it, and one of the things that we first did with our first virtual, our first big virtual event during the pandemic was we sent people boxes, right? We sent packages to people to say, you know, things that they could do while they were at their desk, whether it was a treat or, you know, a treat or, a, you know, snack and a stress ball and all of that. So it really, when, when you first told me about it, just spoke to me in terms of all of that. And then, you know, how the pandemic was going to change the workplace that we could see. And in terms of how people would need, um, you know, assuming such a large portion of the workforce would stay remote how they would still need to interact with each other. And so I'm I'm curious to hear a little bit more about how are you working with 
the companies that that are doing this to kind of build those programs? What do they look like? Um, yeah. and, and is it a lot about remote workers doing stuff together or is it also in person or or at events or, or what have you? So those are great questions. And I will say, um, I feel like it's a work in progress as we keep co-learning with companies and what they're most interested in. Right now, or what we did in a lot of 2023, some companies like you guys have elected to send people boxes as essentially standalone, like take this, you can use the digital content if you choose to scan into it. We realize that we get more engagement when we also have an event that we offer because it there's something about honestly giving people a specific time and deadline, like three o'clock on Friday, this date, we will be doing that. Here's the link. Like that motivates them to actually pay attention, log on, and also connect with their peers. They know all their peers are on Zoom as well. Um, and then having live interactions with the experts also sort of pushes them to get more engaged. Then after that, we have these nudges that we send via email that often, actually always, have a link for something for you to do. So it might be a little micro video clip of just like one exercise, like the bow and arrow, which is one of my favorite because it's kind of fun. Um, but so it could be that. And it's very quick. The whole idea is all the nudges are two minutes or less because we're busy and that doesn't feel overwhelming. But then another thing that we do with companies is use a channel within whatever they're using as their platform. So it might be Slack, it, Teams is usually probably the most common, I would say. Um, but whatever their format is of choice, WhatsApp, we've had people use, we'll jump on and kind of moderate conversations that encourage them after the event in particular to keep doing some of the things, as well as to just ask them other questions that are fun. For example, what's music that you like to work to that helps you feel engaged? And then we'll like make a little playlist of the things that their group comes up with. Or show me a picture of something that makes you feel relaxed or that motivates you when you're at work. And you have people sending in like, here's a fire pit I built. Or here's me with my dad. And here I am with my kids and I love them. And I remember that vacation we had to the beach. Here's a picture. And I think when colleagues share these things with each other, they get to see a dimension of this person that they, you know, may be working with, but in a different capacity. And that builds that kind of, that in itself makes people feel connected, but it also, it, it just makes it more, it, it's like the virtual water cooler, really. You know, mm -hmm. like you know more about the person beyond what you do in your day job. And therefore you're more likely to have a good working relationship particularly if the person you're working with is maybe outside of your immediate work stream. You know, if you're somebody who's in accounting and you're talking to somebody who's in sales, you can like feel more comfortable reaching out to them and be more likely to do so now that you have this like human overlap through For sure. something that you've shared. Yeah. And I, I mean, so I, I think that a couple of the things that I think are really interesting that I'd love to hear you talk about more. I mean, because there's both there's the cultural aspect, right? So the work has changed, you know, work has changed culturally in terms of just that effort to build a culture, right? So post pandemic, building culture within the workplace when you have remote workers. Hard. That's what is we changing. hear from a lot of folks in HR. And I know right. it's hard. Yeah. And then on the flip side, the stress has also increased, right? Especially within exactly. healthcare, but but certainly you know, managing um, that ability to turn off work and turn on work when it is in the home, or even if you're going to the workplace, that's become a little harder in in, in the context of, of the new world that we're in. And I think, you know, we saw a recent article um, in the Times about the Oxford, Oxford study around wellness programs. I mean, wellness efforts within corporations have been, have been there. What are your thoughts on, you know, how things are moving that article that, you know, just kind yeah. of what works and what doesn't. And then, you know, that distinction, I guess, a little bit between workplace culture versus, you know, real efforts for, um, you know, well-being and wellness. I, I, you know, a lot of what, you know, Janae's work centers around with the Sharp Index, you know, that's burnout in an incredibly intense environment 
dealing on a whole other spectrum of mental health, wellness, and stress versus, you know, this the sort of cultural aspect of sharing some health and, and taking personal accountability for that health and, and, and wellness, right? So a lot there. Um, first of all- Yeah, one minute, go ahead. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard a lot from people in HR whom I've gotten to know a lot on this journey about how hard it is to sustain and build a culture. Um, further, as you point out, Megan, stress is at all time high levels. There was one report that I saw that 27% of adults have at one point or another within a certain time frame. I don't remember exactly what it is, but felt so stressed they can't function. Like it's a thing. It costs employers 300 billion a year. It's like a thing. <laughs> Whether you look at that through healthcare, lost producti productivity, people quiet quitting, like all these things are a whole interconnected tangle, I think. Um, I think honestly, workplace wellness has not entirely caught up to the new needs yet. And it's evolving and changing. And that's a space I'm trying to fill. But I, you know, in the past, workplace wellness was often very targeted about particular conditions. So it might be like smoking cessation, or it might be things like encouraging people to get their health risk assessment done, none of which is bad. But increasingly, there's more of a desire. A lot of employees, um, you know, certainly in surveys say that a, a place and a, like that supports their well-being is essential to them. So there was actually a report by Deloitte in 2022 that said 48% of employees have quit over a place that does not support their well-being, which probably wouldn't surprise you, Janae, especially, um, you know. No, and, people are just leaving. Like, yeah, exactly. More than ever. However, They're like, bye. Yeah. And so I don't think that the efforts that employers have put forward to address these things are equal to the need or the desire on the part of employees to address these issues. And I think part of that actually is the overall spending challenge in that, again, nobody wants to increase costs anymore, but when you think about how much is traditionally spent on workplace wellness, as opposed to healthcare insurance, we might think about sort of shifting the balance a little bit. And just as kind of a rough kind of back of the envelope, you know, if you look at research on like, First of all, not all companies are, uh, you know, making available workplace wellness type solutions at this point, um, but some are and engagement is often quite low. So with physical well-being, about 80% of companies offer some sort of program, but 32% of employees are using them. And with emotional and mental well-being, it's an even higher, like 87% are offering them, but only 23% of people use them. Why? I would argue like, yeah, they're argue that they may be offering them, but they also may not be, depending on the individual situation, extremely high quality. And that's because people spend as little as maybe, you know, like I think the average is about $750 per employee per year on a program. And it's like, how much can you really do with that? Often that translates into you get a prize if you walk a few steps. But there's like not a lot more than that. And so it's maybe not so surprising that right. people aren't super engaged. Whereas in healthcare, we're spending on an individual, again, vastly on average, 10 times more than that, at least. What if you put a little bit more into the upstream as opposed to the downstream? Could right. you help to prevent some of those healthcare costs by evading some of the burnout and other healthcare issues from the beginning? Yeah. So I feel like, there's also this point too, which is so important that workplace wellness initiatives can boost and enhance a healthy culture and keep it strong. But you can't just take wellness and well being, even if you pay significantly more for it and like band aid it on and be like, okay, we're good. If you're not really taking into account basic things to sort of support worker um, basic well being, that means not just not working people's super crazy hours. Um, but en enabling people to set some boundaries around where work and life start and end. Um, mm -hmm. It's also about, I think, tapping into people's sense of purpose, making people feel like their voices are heard, 
giving people opportunities to learn and grow, those kinds of things. And I've found, maybe this isn't surprising, but with Ada Rose, the companies that work with us are already highly enlightened. <laughs> and they're like, oh my goodness, we get this. We figured out a lot of these things and we regularly invest in activities that particularly draw in our workforce. We particularly work with folks who are hybrid um, because of the challenges of being both online and off. Um, but we we really don't have companies coming to us who are not don't have enlightened leadership and are thinking about some of these other issues and saying, can you fix it? Because like, right. no, we can't, sorry. But we can help people build habits that are repeatable. We can boost their engagement in things. We can show that they can, you know, their self-reported stress levels can drop 38% after our events, things like that we can do. But you're building mm -hmm. habits and you're building a culture of wellness and you're underscoring that you care about people and that you invest in them. So like these boxes, you guys did this. When you sent them to people, you can have a like a customized message that says, like, we care about you and here's why, specifically mm -hmm. what you do. And when people get that in the mail, it feels like, I mean, we had one employee who wrote and said like, it feels like Christmas, like just getting a package, whether or not it actually was Christmas or the holidays, which sometimes it is, but like other times too, like we care about you is a really, you know, impact. Yeah. Right. Well, and what I, you know, and I loved about it in terms of just obviously that it's so well aligned with what we, you know, sort of promote and discuss on a regular basis on health impact, obviously that also you're a women owned company and a, a female founder. Um, and then, you know, that it's tied to digital health. So it was a slam dunk for us, no question. And then, but I think for, but, but the folks that got it, you know, also just felt like, wow, this is, you know, they thought about it. It's not just a Harry and David box, right? It's a, you know, which would literally be counter, no offense to Harry and David, um, but counter what uh, you know, but. male owned, you know, bad snacks that are bad for you. Um, <laughs> but um, it is so great from that. But I think also, obviously the, the digital component and your flexibility with the kind of programs that you can build that do kind of, you know, not only reflect the culture of the company, but then allow them to kind of promote it, you know, consistently yeah. throughout and that yeah. there's some, you know, that you can kind of develop and customize those tools. Yeah. Um, so I'm excited to hear and, and see how, how it is working within some of some of the companies that, that you've done it. Um, you know, it's such a great thing from an event standpoint as I think for corporate gifts too, but then um, to see how companies, you know, do continue to, you know, evolve with it. Yeah. So just to give you a sense of how we're planning to evolve in this year, it's really um, what we're moving toward and into really soon is more of a model that's continuous so that if people subscribe and they have ongoing digital engagement punctuated by events that are probably mostly virtual, but I definitely have heard that some people are interested in in person as well depending on their situation, which we could also make happen. Um, but like that, that's what we're moving toward, a more holistic year long thing. So it's not like we're gonna do this wellness thing and you'll get some nudges for a few weeks or whatever, but it's, hey, you are going to receive several different packages over time. And they may be smaller than some of these boxes. Like we'll split the things into smaller groupings because there is value, I think, to that, oh, I got something in the mail thing. Like that, I love presents. Pulls attention, right? Who doesn't For love sure. stuff in the mail? Like good stuff. Mm -hmm. um, right. So yeah, that's the plan, and to keep people engaged in between using the digital part longer, and then mm -hmm. incorporating in probably more of things like, you know, gamification and figuring out how to keep people engaged over the longer term, as opposed to just a few weeks. But that's definitely where we're heading. Yeah. No, that's great. And I do, I mean, I, th I love the idea of the in-person. I mean, one of the things, you know, that I thought, you know, when you look at the workforce becoming more hybrid and, and more virtual would be that you would start to see more sort of smaller private, you know, sort of corporate based events or events almost at some of the major conferences for companies that, you know, don't come together as much. And so now that, that now that they're 
not in an office, but that they'd use these conferences and, and use these opportunities as times to come together and to have to come together for different reasons that weren't aren't just the, the straight nine to five or right. eight to seven as the case may be, right? Yeah, it's this question of like, we have these different modalities, like digital, we're working together virtually right now. I think that works pretty well for a conversation, but like, how do you make the best use of each different modality? What are the things that are great to do in person? What are the things that you can do digitally and how do you make them work? How do you intersperse this with like live video events and or physical products? Again, this is a process of iteration. What seems to really resonate for people? Back in the day, we used to do all the things in person all the time. Mm -hmm. It also is hard to do all the things virtually with no components of these other kinds of modalities. So. Mm -hmm. What we're thinking about is how do you how do you kind of take the best use of each of these modes really and right. find them? Yeah, and I I think that um, both mental health and wellness. I mean, there's just there are so many tools, and so you know it is such a you know in terms of the engagement ability, um, you know that you have that with digital, but that you you're not requiring them to you know. It's like whether you want to do yoga at home or Peloton at home versus going to the classes and, and stuff. So it is, you know, and, and the mix is good, right? Because it keeps you, it does that accountability sometimes when you see in person is more engaging. So I love it. Well, to talk about, I mean, of course, you're you're stressed out. Here you are, it's the middle of the pandemic. And, and what does Legia do? She says, I'm going to found a new company. Because that's yeah. not stressful. That seems easy, right? <laughs> not at all. <laughs> so as you know, we talk to founders often and, um, you know, I would love for you to just leave us with some sort of advice on how to, you know, whether that's manage that stress or, you know, even just finding the the space um, within healthcare and, and digital uh, for, for even time for wellness. But um, share with us a little advice for some other entrepreneurs out there. Yeah. So, I mean, the first thing is to work on some component of this that really matters to you, which I think many people do with entrepreneurship in general, but particularly in the health and wellness space, it has to be something that you really genuinely care about. And for me, I do care about health and wellness. I'm also always iterating with it in my own life and trying to figure out what works because it's an ongoing, always adjusting process. So like little things that I do, for example, um, you know, I, I, twice a week I run with a group of women in my neighborhood. So we physically, there's an accountability piece. We physically get together. It is cold. It is dark, but we go out and we talk during these runs and it's fun. So there's like a social piece. That's part of what keeps me sane. I also have joined, um, a, it's a hot yoga studio that does also a lot of things like Pilates which at first I thought was totally inane because it's like 105 degrees and you're exercising in it. But after I tried it a few times, I realized it was actually really powerful. And in fact, um, one of the amazing instructors from there also uh, is an Ada Rose expert in that she does a lot, like co-leads some of our workshops. Um, her name is LaShawn. Uh, but anyway, so I also build that into my life. So again, it's this mix. Occasionally I'll take virtual classes from them. So I don't always have to go there, but it's this community piece. Mm -hmm. um, so those are some things that I prioritize, but even more, I think it's about as I, I keep reminding myself of the lessons of what I'm trying to promote through this business, which is to say, there's always more, particularly with a startup that you could do. There's an infinite amount that you could do. And I make myself stop and prioritize things like sleep or rest or social time, spending time with my kids, because you don't necessarily get a chance to do those things later. And even from the perspective of just the startup, like you have to feed yourself in mm -hmm. those ways if you're going to show up for anyone or anything else. So that is honestly like a constant reminder for me as someone who has over the course of her career, probably worked myself pretty darn close to the edge of burnout at a lot, a number of times and had to sort of intervene on myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in a variety of ways. So yeah, like I work on this because this is a thing that I need help with. 
Right. Love Which I love. Right. It's, you know, it's the key, you know, being a, a working mother is the key to multitasking is to find a job that both meets your passion and supplies, you know, your, your wellness and, and, you know, furthers that. And then, you know, also helps the, the, the people that you're trying to help. So I love it. I loved it from day one. Um, and I'm just so, so glad you could join us today. Um, did you have any parting parting words you wanted to, to share with us? Janae, did you have any more questions for Lydia? I was going to ask for your prediction. Like, what do you think will be the most significant or transformative developments here? Like, how do we bridge that gap between these aren't working and yeah. like the need? Yeah, I think um, ultimately, you know, I believe in the power of consumers, certainly in the context of health and wellness, but also even in the employee sphere. And as we see more and more employees, particularly the younger generations like millennials, stepping forward, I see this in honestly, my own work, in my husband's work, in other people's work too, kind of who work multi-generationally. I think that the younger, like millennials in particular, are really pushing for like boundaries and new ways of working in ways that I never would have done in like right. my 20s or 30s where you were supposed to like not really even maybe admit that you had a home life of any kind particularly a child that might be counted against you it was like a hidden thing whereas now I feel like it's totally okay and almost celebrated not just to be like a whole person who may have familial or other relationships but like hobbies and other parts of your life that matter. And I think the more people are kind of open and demand that workplaces see them as whole humans, um, mm. we, you know, ultimately employers have to look for good talent and have to keep it and support it. And the more people are willing to vote with their feet and, you know, push for these kinds of more like impactful, holistic cultures, as well as programs, um, that's probably the greatest force for change as I see it. And I do, I do see a lot of people in the younger generations, again, thinking through these things a lot more and being more intentional and articulate about it, which I think is a great sign. Oh, thank you. I like that. The younger generation will lead us. Yeah. They are tired of us. <laughs> well, and older generations too. I mean, maybe hopefully, I mean, another really interesting thing is people are staying in the workforce longer instead of maybe just uh, retiring at 65, people go on to have other careers and they want to, they have a little more freedom to shape things and reshape the world in ways that they think are better. So it's not just the, you know, youngest generations, but I think that there's a lot that we can learn from them too. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, no, I, th I think it's, um, you know, the pandemic, even like within healthcare, it brought us from a place where the technology that existed just had to be implemented by necessity. And with the workforce, I think the millennials were moving in that direction, but because of the changes that happened, you know, now it's, they really do have a voice and people had to, and we as, as, you know, whatever generations we are running businesses um, have to have to listen and, and evolve to that because I think it's an evolution, you know, I mean, and I think that that separation between work, while sometimes it's healthy and needed, you know, as you said, that needing to see the whole person and treating them that way um, is essential. And that, you know, they're asking what, in an interview, that culture piece of it is how they're making decisions about where to work. Right. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. I think um, we should. I, I love the idea of doing a virtual week. Maybe we get get all the folks that we gave the gift to and invite them to a, a virtual session where we, um, you know, all get get a chance to use it together. Um, oh, yes. I, was, I actually have. A, I was writing down like absolutely. Like you have a bunch of people that you've given boxes to. Let's mm -hmm. do a session. Absolutely. Yeah. And they're all such amazing people. So it would be a fun. Um, we could do it live yeah. so people could watch us. Health Impact Advisors uh, virtual session. We'll, we'll tee that up for uh, one to come. So that would be super fun. Where will we see you next, Lydia? Are you speaking soon anywhere or go, heading, to, um, heading to some conferences soon? Gosh, I think the American Telemedicine Association uh, is on my uh, 
list of places I will definitely be. That is like Great. the one concrete spot. I think I'm also, I was really excited about the Global Wellness Summit, which I went to last year, but that doesn't happen until next November. Um, so yeah, in between, uh, no doubt okay. I will, I'm finding a lot more, um, actually even tomorrow I'm, I'm really diving into the world of human resources. I'm going to an HR Alliance event, which mm -hmm. is something we don't necessarily think about in the healthcare world, but it's been fascinating for me to dip into these other kind of parallel universes that impact health and wellness and are impacted mm -hmm. by it. So much. Well, yeah. I, and I, I mean, it is interesting. I mean, it, so we've done, you know, and trying to kind of bring together the employer market, um, you know, a lot in HR and it is, it's a funny thing because it should, they, they should talk more about healthcare and they do. Mm -hmm. um, but it is this different, you know, it's a different, um, you know, they come at it from a very different place than, than we do from, you know, when we come from it from digital health or healthcare, but I'd love to hear more about that um, in our next conversation or the next time I see you, or if I see you at ATA, which we will likely go. In fact, that's where we saw you last year. That's where I learned about Ada Rose. Where so. we reconnected after yeah. a little while of not seeing one another through exactly. pandemics, et cetera. So, yeah. Well, thank you again. And um, thanks, Janae. And I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you both, Megan and Janae. It's been awesome speaking with you. Great. And we will for sure share um, how folks can um, get in touch with you about Ada Rose and um, set up programs and, and um, take part themselves um, on the uh, in the links in the chat. Thanks. <laughs>as a physician, I've been honored to walk with my patients across some of the highest peaks and lowest valleys of human experience. What I've found is that healthcare is intensely personal and uniquely human. As I look around the landscape of healthcare today, I see lots of benefits from our new technologies like electronic medical records, uh, telemedicine, wearable sensors, many other things. But one unfortunate side effect is that it has driven a wedge between uh, healthcare workers and their patients. There is a better way. Let's put the human back into healthcare and let robotic process automation take care of all the manual data processing. And so you can recapture the time that you need to build the kind of relationships that patients want to provide the kind of care, healthcare, that they need and they deserve. Limited staffing, manual processes, complex compliance audits, growing cybersecurity risks. Today's digital healthcare landscape demands IT modernization that reduces friction between clinicians and IT teams while keeping patient data secure. That's why top hospitals and healthcare organizations are transforming their identity security programs with SailPoint. SailPoint's identity security solutions empower healthcare organizations to quickly and securely enable clinical workforces with the right access at the right time. Through the power of machine learning, clinicians can spend less time on administrative tasks and more time on patient care. Only with SailPoint's AI-driven identity security can healthcare IT and security teams save time and resources while maintaining a strong security posture. Intelligent identity security simplifies compliance reporting, automates manual processes, and accelerates access decisions. SailPoint expedites identity security with instant frictionless access to the appropriate applications, systems, and data your clinicians need from day one, reducing onboarding time from days to mere minutes. 
From community hospitals to complex healthcare systems, SailPoint helps organizations make rapid identity decisions, protect against overprovisioning, and safeguard sensitive clinical data. No matter the maturity level of your organization's identity security program, SailPoint is ready to help. Discover the core of identity security with SailPoint.